from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew R. Meehan, alongside my partner, the professor, Luigi Rosa Bianca. What's going on this week, Lou? Matt, we have live from Vancouver, Canada, the small business Viking, Roy Oting. Roy, you've coming out with a, a book in the very near future called Be Different or Be Dead. What are small business owners doing that is wrong? What do they need to do differently? Well, one of the main things, and by the way, thank you. I'm grateful for you guys having me on your show. I really appreciate the opportunity to get my message out for so many people. Um, generally speaking, I think one of the biggest challenges businesses today of all sizes have got is, is to uh, effectively differentiate themselves in the marketplace. Uh, like it's not being done very well, okay? Like just, just think about the competitive claims out there. And it's not just small to medium business, it's businesses generally. And how they, how they describe their, their competitive advantage uses words like, and I call them claptrap guys. I mean, there's words like better and best and number one and leader. And quite frankly, they don't mean anything. Okay, it's just, it's just aspirational mumbo jumbo. And so I've created this concept called the only statement. And it's, it's in my, my work and you can find it on my website. And it's, it's a very specific way to define what your value proposition is. It answers the question, why should I do business with you as opposed to somebody else? Now, the only statement says, we are the only ones that. Okay, so when you compare that to, to a lot of the claptrap that's out there, I mean, it's, it's binary, right? It either exists or it doesn't exist. It's easy to measure, unlike we're the market leader, which I don't know what the hell that means, right? Because I can spin numbers any way you want. But when I say I'm the only one that, you can observe it and you can judge it and you can reach a conclusion that it's right or wrong. And so a big part of what I'm trying to do these days is get businesses to kind of like start thinking about what they're truly special at what they're truly unique at and to get clarity around describing that. And the tool that I offer is the only statement. And I have to tell you guys, it's really catching on. I mean, people are jumping all over this. I mean, I'm getting emails all the time with draft only statements saying, Roy, I've had a go at this, dude. Here it is. You know, what do you think? And I'm happy to, to, to actually have those conversations with people because uh, it's fun. Roy, do you think that your book is just a result of timing because let's think about it up until a couple of decades ago every town had the baker candlestick maker the cobbler the mechanic and you'd always go see joe or jack because there was that familial relationship but with the advent of e-commerce and the internet now you don't have one or two choices in a town you literally have hundreds of choices in a town within in, in the town of america so, or North America. So how do you differentiate? How, how do you make that only statement to make you unique? Well, therein lies the challenge um, because, you know, the consequences are if you're not different, you're dead. Hence the reason why I call all my work be different or be dead. I mean, the basic idea is if you can't figure it out, then you're done, right? And, and, and when, I, when I say that, it's to be dramatic, but it's also to describe the ultimate consequence of not figuring it out. OK, now I've, I've created a process behind the work and it's not easy. There's a lot of people that say, you know what, Roy, I don't think I'm special at anything. And I went, I go, well, OK, uh, you may not have thought about it in a certain way. Let's go through the process. And it's 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 in a very abbreviated way, guys. Here's what it looks like. You first of all, define the customer segment that you're interested in targeting. Okay, this is not a mass market tool, okay? Because I don't believe that mass markets exist anyways, because that presumes that everybody in the market segment is equal in some respect. And the reality is everybody's different. The challenge is for the marketing dude to figure that out. Okay, so what you do is you, you target your, your efforts 
to a very small number of segments that will allow you to achieve your growth objectives because you don't want to spe spread yourself too thin. So let's say we got customers group A, that's our target. The second step in the only process is to define what they care about, not necessarily what they need, okay? There's a big difference between needs and what I call cravings. Like I think the marketing juice is in the cravings, not the needs, because basically, uh, most people have got their needs satisfied anyways. And if you want to play in that space, typically you're going to end up competing on price and that, that will render you a commodity and margins, you know, shrink, et cetera, et cetera. And so figure out what they care about. And then with that information, start to look at the capabilities that you have as an organization to play into that caring space versus what the competitors do. And that's where the competitive analysis and your self, your sort of introspective view of, of what makes you special occurs. It, this is not something that you do overnight. And it's also, it's also something that never ends, okay? People will say to me, well, how will I know when I have my only right? And I keep saying, well, you'll never have it right. You need to treat this as a draft because if you don't, it presumes that the world's not gonna change, right? And we all know that the world will change. And so we need to keep nimble and be able to shift and revise our only on the way, okay? So that's the overall process. Clearly there's a lot more, more detail in there, but I've worked with clients um, and let me give you an example, okay? Can I give you an example of an only statement that I think is just Please spoken? Do. And, and this, this, is, this comes from um, somebody who's in the, um, uh, in the ambulance business. So this, this is a company called St. John Ambulance in the Vancouver area. And, and this is their only statement. St. John Ambulance is the only first aid advocate that provides safety solutions anywhere, anytime. Now that took probably, I'd say a couple of days, which relatively speaking is pretty quickly to come up with that. The reason it's powerful is it talks about solutions, not flogging products. That's another thing we can talk about because I think marketing is a bust today because all they do is flog iron and, and products and apps, et cetera. And what people really want are benefits and solutions. So, so this only statement promulgates solutions and the words anywhere, anytime are powerful because what they're basically signing up to do is say, look at when you need some safety solutions, we're here for you wherever you are, whenever you want us. And the truth is, that's what they're doing. And so they are they stand out. People look at them and go, wow, that's amazing. Do you guys really do that? And they say yes, and they have proof points. And so that's the other thing. You know, you start executing around it. You learn more about it. You tweak it, okay, as you go and as you learn. And, and it's an ongoing kind of like, I would say, journey that, that quite frankly never ends. Roy, I think we're, we're touching on something salient right now in, in the market. And let's just take one step back because I love where this conversation is going. The gig economy right now is prevalent. You know, the American dream has changed. You know, the young whippersnapper is now wanting to do his own, his own gig, right? Like they've given up that dream of working for someone else. However, the underlying tone there is they don't appreciate how difficult it is to create a business, to create a brand, because it's one thing to create a job, but it's another thing to create a business. Talk us through how you deal with startups in trying to differentiate that, that, that chasm. Yeah, no, it's a really good, it's a really good issue. And I, and I do deal an awful lot with, with uh, younger um, high testosterone uh, male CEOs who, who have this great idea, and I've got some females as well, uh, who's got this, these great ideas and they want to know how to monetize them, right? And so my first question to them is, okay, I don't want to know about the technology. I don't care about the technology. Tell me how your idea is unique. And that stops a lot of them dead in their tracks because what they've done is they've brought a technology mindset a product mindset, not a kind of a holistic comparative mindset that talks about why should I do business with you? This gets back to my question that the only statement answers. And so generally, um, I take them through what I've created as my own, I call it my strategic planning process. Because when I was in business in this data world, trying to grow a business substantially, you know, all of the pedantic 
traditional strategic planning approaches just simply didn't work for me for one simple reason. They were not built to execute. And for me, if you don't have a strategic planning process that allows you to execute real quick, then it's worthless, right? And as an aside, we spend way too much time on the plan, guys. And we spend 80% of our time trying to get it pristine, et cetera, and 20% trying to figure out how to actually execute it, which is exactly the opposite to what we should be doing in my experience. And so when I'm dealing with a startup, I bring my strategy building process, which is really simple. Okay, it, it answers three questions. So if you wanna build a strategic game plan, the first question you ask is how big do we wanna be? Now that's a question around what are your growth intentions from a revenue point of view over the next 24 months? It's not a five-year plan because the fifth year never shows up. It never shows up, right? And if you want, if you wanna execute, you gotta have a short term planning horizon, particularly when you consider how um, how random and, and how unpredictable the economy is. And so we work that through. The second question is, who do you want to serve? And that basically poses the question, where are you going to get the money? Right. And that's what I get, was getting at earlier, that 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 the definition of the customer segments that you're going to go after that will fuel your growth. The third piece is how are you going to compete and win? And that's the creation of the only statement. So I actually do this with clients in like a day and a half where start to finish, we have an executable game plan uh, around their idea. And I drag them through that because you have to go through all three steps. You can't simply start with gee whiz technology and let's go flog it. There's, you know, there's too many dead startups that, that have tried to succeed that way. And there's no substitute for taking two days, two days of your time to actually get it right. And that two days, by the way, represents like a minuscule amount when you compare with a typical strategy building process that will take, in some cases, months and millions of dollars to create and get you nowhere further than than employing my my process. Hey, Roy, how long did it take you to take your startup from zero to a billion dollars in sales? Well, I don't know. I mean, it was like seven or eight years. OK. Because don't forget, this was at the time when the data world was growing really, really quickly, okay? It was being driven by um, deregulation in the telecom space. And, um, and so the latent demand that was there, fueled by technological capabilities, okay, resulted in, in extreme growth potential. But when we started, we didn't, we didn't have a billion in mind. We knew that the opportunity was really large. And so every year we set order of magnitude, how big objectives, right? The growth targets that I was just mentioning, Luigi, we set big ones. And it was only in retrospect that we looked at, at our performance and went, wow, you guys realize what we just did? I mean, over a number of years, we actually were able to take the business to, to that level. But we had no idea when we started out. All we knew it was big and we had to be bold. And that's the other thing here is that if you don't set yourself bold objectives, you have no incentive to be innovative, okay? Like I'm a believer that the number, that the growth target is actually, is actually the fodder for how well you innovate. Like if you set yourself uh, an incremental goal, then there's no need to be boldly uh, innovating things. If you set yourself an audacious goal, on the other hand, you have no choice but to figure it out. Right. And so, you know, I look at, at at ridiculous goals as actually the fuel for innovation. And it's proven to be the case in my experience. And I look around and it's it is the case. Look at how many people Google something and copy it. I mean, how many people benchmark best in class and try to adopt what somebody else has done and are intellectually dishonest enough to claim that that's innovation happens all over the place. And it's absolutely dead wrong. And so. I, I just won't let people do that. I mean, I, I, I think if you want to Google something, you know, don't Google something that's related to your strategy. What you need to do is you need to be creative and innovative and bold. And that's fueled by a simple, a simple statement. And that statement is, I don't know. If you don't know something, you have to figure it out without copying somebody. Guess what? You have to be creative and innovative. And as you guys say, out of the box. I call it breakaway thinking, 
Okay, I don't call it I don't call it pivoting. Pivot is a is an insipid word that that it, that implies you're on a fulcrum and you change the direction. I'm all about getting rid of the fulcrum and inventing a new one. Okay, that's breakaway thinking. And I got to tell you, it's the source of my conclusion that businesses tend to be really really underperforming. And I've used the word mediocre, and that's really my intent, right? Is to describe the way businesses are are done, the way startups approach themselves, and and all the money that gets left on the table, okay? Because they don't understand this whole differentiation piece, this only piece, this execution piece, which is all about building audacious businesses funded by what people care about not necessarily what they need. Roy, is your approach different for service businesses versus manufacturing versus SaaS? Like, is there a different approach or is it one size fits all? It's absolutely the same. Okay, because every business needs to have growth targets, regardless of what business they're in. Every business needs to understand who their target customer groups are regardless of what business they're in. And every business needs to think through how they're special and what their competitive advantage is, regardless. And so I've applied this. I mean, it's really, it's it's a generic process that, that postulates um, that we need to execute on something, okay? Regardless of the kind of business you're in, et cetera. I mean, I've done this work with, uh, with a startup, this is really interesting, in Vancouver, called MUG Solutions, and MUG, M-U-G, stands for Manhole Underground, okay? Now, the business problem that this woman had was, was the following. In the, in the downtown east side in Vancouver, um, there was a problem in the telecom world with people sticking used needles and used syringes down the manholes after they were using, okay? That's, that's how they deposited them. The problem was the telecom guys would open the manhole, go down the manhole, and guess what they would do? They would step on these used syringes. So clearly, you know, a major safety problem. She came up with an idea that was a device that actually capped the holes on the manhole so that nobody could shove anything down the manholes. And as a result, presented a major solution to a, to a, a problem that, that people were having. So, so I helped her develop the solution. And, and here's, here's her only statement, which I think you might, you might enjoy. She says, we are the only permanent solution that provides biohazard contaminants, such as used syringes, and all other debris from entering manholes. Now, do you realize how many manholes there are in the world? I mean, really, I mean, there are millions of, and that was the problem that she had because she could see all these manholes, right? And she wanted to go after the world. And I said, no, not going to do that. We're going after Vancouver. We're going to get Vancouver first and earn the right to grow. And that's the other piece, guys, that startups, they're mesmerized by, with the, by the art of the possible as opposed to the reality, okay, of what you can physically achieve and this whole notion of earning the right to grow. She's now extremely successful because she's got, she's captured the manholes in Vancouver and now she's looking at, at worldwide manholes and she used the process. And that's a, that's, that's a specific business, but the same process that I use with her, I've used with, with retailers, I've used with hospitality, I've used with banking institutions, the same thing. Roy, when I go to the business section of any bookstore, um, it troubles me to see the waste of trees row after row after row just we're just killing trees with useless books and there's another word that we we're not allowed to say on this podcast and it's spelled c-o-a-c-h it's a curse for us we don't like to say that word <laughs> because if someone has the audacity to give advice with a business book that person should be an authority you roy are an authority tell us what was your genesis? What was your background? What created the Roy Osing aura? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for the very kind comment. And it, it, does, it does speak to, to why I'm different than, than most people writing and, and doing what I'm doing, because my stuff is not founded on textbook theories. My stuff is not based on formulas advocated by prof professors and 
and business schools. Okay, my stuff is based on what I was able to practically achieve. And that was driven by simple solutions, not complex solutions, simple solutions that actually lit fires in people. See, I'm, I'm a believer that, that the intellect is an interesting piece of our anatomy, but it does not lead to execution of anything, right? It may lead to understanding, but you need fire going on in your gut and passion in your belly to actually do something. That's audacious. That's who I am. That's, that's what motivated me, motivated me to, 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 in the way that I practice leadership. Okay. So, so I'm different. Okay. And a lot of people are kind of like, they're not sure about whether that's cool with them. And the reason for that is they've been taught that things in textbooks are right. Right. The things that are backed up by theory are right. That we've been taught to color inside the lines. We've been taught not to stand out. I can remember my mother telling me in school, Roy, don't you ever come home with a note that says the teacher noticed you and you were standing out in the class because for some reason, the connotations of that are negative, right? So we grow up with that. Well, what I did is I actually went 180 to that whole thing and I had to do it, okay? In terms of your Genesis question, I was asked to take and create an organization out of a data culture, or sorry, out of a voice culture and a voice world. I was asked to change a culture from what was traditionally a business into a completely new business. And so you don't do that, okay, by extending the past into the future. You do that by blowing it up and creating something new. And so what I had to do is break away from all of that momentum of the past, voice world, voice order taking, monopoly thinking, all that kind of stuff. I had to break that in half and create something new. And so the, the genesis of the leadership I had to uh, learn and adopt was actually doing that, going from an old world to a new world, going from um, copying things to creating things, going from doing stuff for your boss versus doing stuff for the front line, right? The, all of that, doing stuff that made sense from an engineering point of view to doing stuff that made sense from a marketing and customer service point of view, going from order taking to creating memorable experiences. I mean, those are juxtapositions in terms of concepts, right? You don't get there by pivoting. You get there by breaking it and going on and creating something new. So that's what I had to do. And it was, I got to tell you, that's when I learned that pain is indeed a strategic concept <laughs> because it was painful because I was pushing against all of these forces that didn't want me to break away, that they were comfortable in the past, even though they, at the same time, through the other side of their mouth, were, were insisting that I needed to create a high performance organization. And they didn't realize that the only formula that made sense there is you had to break away from what you traditionally did. And so I guess I had to break away. It wasn't something that I wanted to do, which is a really important thing for you to get here. I'm a very performance oriented leader. Okay, if it didn't make sense, in terms of driving the bottom line performance of the organization, I didn't do it. And so all of the, the different ideas I came up with, they weren't, they weren't ideas that were just cool. The only, only statement is cool, but that's not why we created it. That's not why I created it. I needed it to create a differential advantage to drive bottom line performance of the organization. So I'm, I'm the guy that says I evaluate tactics on the basis of their strategic contribution. And if they didn't contribute, I didn't do them. And so I took that at a very young age and started to work and work and work at that through the organization. And I became known as this, this guy that, that clearly was a contrarian, clearly loved to go against the flow, clearly loved pain. Otherwise, why the hell is he doing this? Right. <laughs> and so, and I've, I've applied that same, that same principle to everything in my life, guys. It's a way I deal with my grandchildren, a way I deal with my life. Roy, I'm curious, uh, in your prior company, two, three years in, what was your audacious sales goal for the following year? Well, typically it would, I don't know, I can't remember the numbers, to be honest, but the approach was it had to be beyond reach. 
like it, it, to to the mere mortal person sitting in a, around with the strategy table, and I had like I don't know ten direct reports, and we'd sit around and we'd practice Roy's "Let's Head West" strategic planning philosophy, which is exactly what I have. Okay, it's like let's let's get a general idea of where we want to go, and let's really bear down on execution, and we will learn through executing what the what the particular point is. So if I'm going to go west, I'm going to I may end up in Vancouver. I may end up in Los Angeles. I don't know when I start. And that's not unreasonable. Okay, because there's just too many variables to try and account for. And as I said earlier, I'm not the formula guy, right? I don't plug formulas. So let's head west and and put in place audacious revenue goals. That's the other point I want to make with you is when you come to set growth goals, it's all about top line revenue. It's not about profitability because I can manipulate an income statement easy. I can manip easy, right? But you can't run and hide from top line revenue because that's what the market thinks of you and the value you provide, right? And so what we would do is we would set revenue targets that we clearly did ha had no idea how we were gonna get to. And it goes back to what I just said earlier. The source of innovation is I don't know. Was it, was it uncomfortable? Oh my God, was it ever uncomfortable? But, but we believed, we believed that we were smart enough to figure it out on the run, how we were going to get there. And, and literally, we didn't miss a year. I mean, you don't get to a billion from a relatively young organization without hitting numbers. And I, to be honest with you, I don't know exactly what the year over year growth was, but it was order of magnitude. And it started out with that basic belief that, that I don't know and heading west. Now, obviously, I didn't spin it to the board that way, okay? But I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> you know, I, I gave all of the, the pedantic kind of like, you know, justifications behind the numbers. But in reality, and a lot of people would say, particularly board members, they go, are you sure, Roy, that you guys can achieve that? And I would say, um, I don't know for sure. I do know it's aggressive, but we're going to give it our best shot. And good for them for saying, okay have a go. And particularly when we got through the first couple of years and they saw the results, they went, okay. And then they would hit me with, are you sure it's aggressive enough? <laughs> so they, they'd hit me with my own stuff. I hated that. Yeah. You know, I love that so much because I think a lot of companies think they're going to be somewhere in 10 years where they shouldn't have no idea because it means they're not growing and adding other verticals into their business, right? If you ask me and Luigi, I can tell you what the next 24 months look like. I can't tell you what the next 10 years look like, right? Because we're doing so many different things and we're pulling from different industries and different arenas and sandboxes we've never played in before, right? But we're okay with uncertainty. We actually thrive on it where other people, you know, shrivel up and hide in a corner. Yeah, and and you're, you're I mean, that's the only realistic perspective to have these days. Like, like I say, five-year plans, 10-year plans, they exist only to satisfy finance people who don't understand it anyways, right? So, I mean, I can give you a business plan if you want to go raise capital, okay? But don't ever think that that's going to be executable. I mean, I'd, your, your approach is right. You take, you take 30 or 24 periods of 30 days, guys. That's the plan. And that's 24 months. It's not two years. And there's a reason why you don't talk about it in two years. Because a year sounds like it's long, Right. If you want to focus on execution, you want to talk about short time periods. And I always would talk about 30 days. Like when we were growing quickly, we reviewed our performance literally every month. Right. What's working, what's not working. Just get down on it. Get down on how much more have we learned. Right. Do we have to tweak based on what we learned? Do we have to change the execution approach based on how we did? And so it was hands on. And it's the only way you can grow. OK. Anybody out there thinks that they can put together a five-year plan and throw it out on the organization and expect it to work is smoking something really powerful smoking something it just doesn't happen this is hard work it's in the trenches every day with frontline people and the people who are who are responsible for executing your strategy it's a lot of do-it-yourself leadership like one of the things i believe in is strategic micromanagement now a lot of people get upset about this because they've been taught I'll get to that in a minute. They've been taught that as leaders, we need to delegate, right? I mean, pick up any textbook. 
that we have to delegate. I'm sort of from the school that believes that there are certain things you delegate and certain things you don't delegate. Like, for example, you never delegate the responsibility for communicating the strategic plan to the organization. And yet there's a lot of leaders that throw that to business development and say, OK, here's the strategy. Go explain it to the rest of the organization. No, that's a leadership's role to do that. You don't delegate that. You don't delegate architecting the customer moment is another example. I mean, in my life, I was I was to the level uh, where where we actually define the behaviors required in customer service to create memorable experiences. I was involved in that architecture. Why? Because customer loyalty was important to what? My financial performance. And who owns that? Me. Nobody else. And so I picked and cho choose, chosen, uh, ch chose some things that other people would go, Roy, you're getting involved, too, you're getting way too involved in the organization. And I'd say, thank you. I consider that a compliment because that's my job, right? And so, yeah, that, that, uh, that whole approach to keep it close where you can feel it, Matthew, what you, what you just said, that's absolutely the right way to do it. And, and having a gut feel for what's right, I mean, is always you, always, you always go to a large extent with how you feel about things. And you will learn as you execute whether your feelings served you well or not. Sometimes they don't. Okay, that's life. You just, you just tweak it, you know, break away and you move somewhere else. That's just the way it is. So, Roy, this is book number seven that's coming out for you. Right. Why don't you tell everybody in the audience when it's coming out and where they can get it? Yeah. So the uh, the ebook actually is available right now. It's called "Be Different or Be Dead: The Audacious and Unheard of Ways I Took a Startup to a Billion in Sales." Boom. I mean, come on. Who would not want to read that? And particularly in your your audience that are interested in growth. Um, so that's the title of the book. It's going to be available in print form on all of the the book selling channels. May the 31st, exciting day for me, exciting day. And I hope an exciting day for a lot of other people. Like I've already got advanced copies and I'm I'm providing them on there and people are loving it. I'm getting great feedback. I'm doing work with guys like you and I'm getting really nice, nice feedback that says, hey, I think I'm on the right path, but I keep going at it. I have a website. It's called be different or be dead.com. It's the only be different or be dead.com out there. <laughs> uh, so it's <laughs> so it's unique. Uh, it's a resource for people. OK, so this is what, what I'm trying to do is create it as a resource. So you can go to the website and you can look at my blogs. I blog every week on this stuff and I've been doing it since 09. OK, so there's a lot of content on the stuff that we've discussed this morning um, for people to go and say, wow, what, what really is that planning process about? I've written a lot about it. Go there if you're interested you'll get more information. There's also a book page. So it's got uh, access to all my books, where you can go to buy them, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one other aspect of my website that I think makes me a little unique. And that is, I have a Gmail address, roy.osing at gmail.com. And I'm happy to engage with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis around my stuff. I mean, if you have an issue and you want a, another pair of eyes, I'm not prescriptive because I don't have the right to be. All I have is ideas that worked. And so if people are interested in that, email me, email your draft only to me. You guys, you had better put together an only statement and you better send it to me. Okay. Is that a deal for doing this? Yes, email sir. It to me. <laughs> hey boy, I'm, I'm curious. And this is on a personal level. What you've done throughout your career requires a lot of work. How much of that do you attribute to that wholesome Scandinavian upbringing? <laughs> well, I don't know, but you're absolutely right. It takes a ton of energy. It takes a lot of pain tolerance. And I don't know. I don't know where that that came from. I know my grandfather was a hard rock miner in a place called Kimberley, B.C., and, uh, and he was a miner in Norway before he left, and he brought some really cool, innovative mining techniques to Canada. And he worked his buns off every day of his life, maybe. And my grandmother, in her own way, was the same. And maybe, just maybe, I got some of that. I don't know. But, um, you know, there's certain things that excite me that 
that create this reservoir of energy that I can draw on. I mean, I, I'm getting a little older, so the reservoir, meh, not as deep as it used to be, but nevertheless, um, I don't know what it was, it, but it was, it. I've always been driven. I've always been driven to do this kind of stuff ever since, uh, even at university, but particularly since I left university. And once I started to see the traction of the breakaway thinking, I mean, that was just, that just gave me more juice, gave me more juice. And so maybe the lesson is for people is, is to step out, really push yourself, experience the euphoria of progress, get the juice and just keep going. That's all you can do. Roy, thank you so much for being here, man. We want to be respectful of your time, but before I do let you run, you being a wordsmith and all, authoring seven books, <laughs> describe yourself in one word for us. Audacious. <laughs> I love that. I had a feeling that was coming. <laughs> Roy, thank you. Guys, that's a wrap of the Liquid Lunch Project. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to the show. And make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of the Liquid Lunch Project.